I wanted to go to the Slay because I'd read all the art history books. I'm English. I wanted to go where the Euston Road had come from. I was interested in the Camden Arts you know, crew. I was interested in Augustus John at the time. God forbid. Um, so presumably the London School. Yeah, the London School. Exactly. Yeah, the London School. I mean, I was interviewed by Patrick George, who was a protege of William Coldstream. Uh, Ewan Eugler used to teach me in the life room. You know, so it was all it very much part of that, uh, yeah, pedigree, if you like. And Bacon and, and Freud were very much the establishment oh. figures of the day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, uh, I think I was 19 when I first started drinking in the Colony Room Club, which you may have heard of, presumably. Um, this old haunt in Soho where the carpet is still, was walked by the ghosts of Francis Bacon. And I think, he didn't, when did he die? 1992, was it? 1991? I can't remember now. I started going there in 92. And we all wanted to meet him. All of us were piling from college to just, just to meet Francis. Have you met Francis? Have you met Francis? You know, we never did. And how did this af affect your, your studies at the time about how you were making painting then? Well, I suppose, well, specifically to think about Bacon, he was someone who was always there in my mind, if you like. It's the way... <clears throat> I suppose I wasn't aware of it at the time, but it, the, the visceral aspects of it, the sort of sexual aspects that... The sort of the, um, the, the, is it fighting or is it screwing? Is that kind of, I wasn't so much involved in that at the time, but I was interested in how does this guy put the paint down? How does he do that? How does he push things together? How does he take those risks? What's going on in his studio? You know? So coming out of the Slade in, what, 92? Yeah. Um, you'd come out effectively as, a, as an academically trained young establishment oh, yeah, yeah. figure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yet the art world was changing in very, very different directions at that particular moment. I mean, we're talking exactly uh, Freeze time, Damien Hirst Freeze show. We're talking about... Well, that it. all passed us by. That was in 1988. I left in 92. It was just a wasteland. It was like... <laughs> I mean, there was like one art magazine made on crappy paper, and that wasn't even Art Monthly, you know. It was just nothing. I mean, who did we have to look at as a painter? I think we looked at Fiona Ray. I think we looked at uh, Gary Hume. And I think um, some of us kind of looked at Jenny Savile, but tried not to too much. But there we were. It was all over the, it was all over the media at the time. So there was nothing for us to... There, there was nowhere where we could put our work. What could we do? There was no, no, no platform, no format for young, figurative English painters to work at all. It's taken a long time for that circle to come right around. I always wanted to step aside from the portrait world in the end. I wanted to engage with what there was going on in my head, should we say. Yeah. Stories. I want to tell stories. You'll see there's lots of sort of grid marks on a lot of the paintings which come and go. And that, that's so I can exactly reference the collage I've made and, and get it up onto the canvas straight away. So I'm not, I don't use a projector like many artists because the, the surface and the whole painting is very, very active right for the last minute. Everything you see here is probably the last day of work. Well, not everything, but this is the last layer. There's a whole palimpsest of... of collaging of layers and layers and layers, this sort of sediment, if you like, of ideas that have worked from the first collage. So I make, I make the initial image, get excited about that, grid up, make a print from the computer, scale that up using the grids I was talking about, and then I'll literally put it here. I've got a, I've got sort of rigged up a, um, uh, sort of a, a, what do you call it? Um, yeah, a music stand. I have a music stand here. I clip it on, and it's like this, paint away. Okay, that point there, that point there, and I sort of get all these nodes where I'm going to start working. And I'll sketch it out very, very quickly. With, with pencil or charcoal? Uh, with normally just very watered-down paint. I don't tend to draw it out with charcoal or anything like that. So, it's, so very quickly, within the first day, I know what the composition is going to look like. And then I'll often go back and uh, reassess what's happening on the, on the canvas on my computer. Sometimes I'll photograph the picture, Sometimes I'll draw on the digital version of it. And this is a constant process happening all the time as the picture evolves. And a piece like this usually takes about a month to make. This is taken from a collage image I made from a late 19th century medical uh, painting, a photograph, uh, where it's probably a dissection or something like that is going on. So I've always been drawn to those, that kind of specific imagery, if you like. The first time I saw this particular painting, Crash, yeah. for me it was the first moment that it brought your personal hi history and experience as a child of hospitals. Yeah. I mean, I used to wear these as a, young, as a kid, you know, I, I had straps on my legs and things, you know. You know that, that's quite a thing to remember, you know, getting strapped in boots. So you'll often find in my paintings, um, 
the physical form, the body, wrapped, held, controlled by an outside force, if you like. It could be a rod. It could be the pressure that's made from an abstract shape cutting in, starting to, sort of, starting to vivisect the form, if you like. This painting here, which is called Perimeter, now, what you see here is a picture of guys with balloons in a dark space. Now, before these balloons came in, this was just a painting. There's a figure here. This wasn't here, blah, blah, blah. And I was waiting for some friends outside the Angus Steakhouse. We weren't going to eat there, I hasten to add, but at Oxford Circus. And um, I had my phone on me. The balloons were blowing outside the shop. And I just took a quick, quick about three snaps of them with the flash. And this, this picture I was having really real issues with. What am I going to put in that's going to electrify the painting? And I just, right at the last, after three weeks of painting, I just bashed in the balloons really quickly. And suddenly it all started to come into play, you know? You've described them as a vehicle for colour and light yeah. in your yeah. pictures. I'd also like to add in that they're a, an obstruction. You are often looking for pictorial devices that are going to obstruct our view of other things within the pictures. Uh, yeah, it's quite important. A few years back, it was dustbin bags that, yes. were, that were playing that role. Yeah. But recently, I mean, I know you have been through a very dark phase. I mean, literally, there have been yes. very dark canvases. And you've been increasingly introducing very bright colors. Presumably, the balloons were also a solution. They were a catalyst for, for the color. They're a very obvious. Um, well, they're a very obvious element in the picture. They're a carrier of abstract form, the color, like I said before, the shapes, the architecture, the volume. And I was trying to work out what, what is it that interests me in this. Uh, Matt mentioned that I, I paint a lot of bin liners. I've painted bin liners for 20 years. I've been very interested in that. There's something about the way, the way the plastic is stretching around the object inside, and that's something that brings me back to the caliper I was talking about earlier on, the way that something that holds your body. There's something about the plastic, the balloons or the bin liners, it holds the form. What's happening? I think with the balloons, it was very much a visceral response I had. It's a, it's a pressure happening inside. Is it, is it a cyst? Is it, what's going on? And that's something I wanted to make work about. And, but then by putting them against other people, suddenly a narrative is set up. The, sort of the mystery, what is this narrative? You've described these motifs, such as the balloons and, and bin bags, as kind of being stand-ins or substitutes for the body, well, yeah, as if yeah. it's an analogy yeah. for flesh and fluids yes. and uh, membranes. And, uh, I, right. I mean, th there's no nude forms. There's no life room painting in these pictures, are there? Clearly, it, they're pictures of human beings and situations. But they're, they're quite oblique, I hope. I hope they are. And like you say, for me, uh, the balloons, the skin of the balloon, the plastic is a stand-in for that. In the same way that um, on the map painting over there, there's these veins and lines, the, the, the frontiers become this, this interior corporeal reality, if you like. Something that happens very interesting when you start painting. You have to decode the JPEG I'm working from. It's a very low-resolution res JPEG. And I had to find what was happening here in the painting just by the actual action of painting. You're decoding, you're putting down. You have to think what it is to bloody paint the thing. So all I could see were these tiny points of light and this strange sort of horizon. What is going on here? And I realized it was snow. You know? So these guys are in a place in snow. So he, he's got his shirt off. He must, so that's not right, is it? You know, I like to set that up. And then what's underneath the snow? And it, maybe it relates to what's happening in that painting over there, Resort, which is all covered in snow as well. What's being wrapped? It, it, it comes back to what I was saying about the balloons and the vinyl and the plastic. What's underneath? What's, what is this mystery? I started this about a year ago, and <clears throat> it was made from, as I said, the uh, Soviet bloc interior. These were taken from um, a medical book I bought when I, when I was on a trip to Brussels. And it was a 1950s book on medicine. And these are, these are surgeons prepping for theatre. 60 years ago. But I like the way they were suggestive of something else. This one strikes me particularly as being quite cinematic, theatrical almost. Uh, are films an important influence on your work? Of course, yeah. I think we're all fairly influenced by I think if we're involved in fi uh, visual imagery, how can we not be? Yeah, clearly. Yeah. And I've, I've been a lover of film. 
and I know that literature is obviously also, fiction is very important to you. Yes, I'm very interested in um, sort of post-war English writing. I, I, I'm particularly influenced by Ballard. Ballard's a, a writer, J.G. Ballard, I've <clears throat> read a lot. A lot. You mentioned in one interview that you uh, have always been excited by the way Ballard took science fiction yeah. inside, inner space, yeah, the, rather than it, outer yeah, space. Yeah, it's, it's the inner psychological space in his work. And that's something I suppose I, 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 I do try to bring in with this work as well. I, whether it's successful or not, I couldn't possibly be the judge. But yes, that's something I learned from. It is my own psychopathology happening here. I mean, you, are, you guys are my shrinks looking at my pictures. This is it. This is, this is it. And that, that's sort of an honesty, if you like, with the engagement of the imagery. Yeah. So it's very, very, very personal from that point of view. The most seductive, which is a strange word, the most seductive sort of photojournalism, if you like, the most sensational, the most, the most famous, if you like, are almost impossible to use. I, I may see um, a photograph of an event, but it might be something that's happening behind that event that I will scan and use, partly because um, it's someone else's image and partly because I don't want, I'm, I'm looking for the obscure in that image. Um, and obviously when I, when I put them and, and push them against other objects, they, they become mine, if you like. Straight away I was meeting former East German artists. You know? um, we were talking together. We were looking at each other's paintings. Suddenly there's a dialogue happening. Figurative painters, former Eastern Europe. And this is something that I've really seen now, more and more. A few years later, I opened an art magazine, and there was a painting by an, a, Romanian <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me a, a Romanian painter I'd never heard of before, Adrian Genie. And he was painting legs coming out of a box. I was like, bloody hell, who's doing legs coming out of objects? That's what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, well, luckily, since then, uh, we've become friends. And uh, Jane, who I've worked with, and yourself, Matt, have introduced me to these guys. And it's been fascinating that the opening up of the former Soviet and Eastern Bloc areas of Europe have brought these classically trained artists, the tradition of the figurative classically trained artists, still existed and probably still does right now. I remember when you uh, did your Master Piper exhibition, which was, I say, obliquely referencing the Yugoslav wars and uh, yeah, genocide, course, ethnic yeah. cleansing. Uh, Kosovo springs to mind instantly. Um, I know that at that moment, the Eastern European painters, particularly the, the Romanian painters and the, the Cluj school, were instantly fascinated by what you were doing and started taking a lot of note of what you were doing at that point because you were kind of painting about Eastern Europe. Yeah, what right did I have, you know? What, why is this English guy, this soft lad, painting about stuff we kind of own, you know? That, that's our history. Those are our legends. But for me, it, was, it wasn't about their particular legend. It was about just humanity in its whole, if you like. I'm part of humanity. I see what's going on. I want to make work about it. So from that point of view, I felt valid. Now, resort for me is one of the, the most uh, whimsical, almost uh, surreal, reverie-like works that you've made in a long time. Most of the paintings you create have very real three-dimensional space in. There are often twists and schisms and ruptures within your spatial organization. But this, for me, is teetering on the brink of, of, of floating away. Of collapse. Yeah. It's, it's a conflict I always have. I'm a realist painter, but I also want to you know, ram in abstract elements because I'm not, I don't want to paint photographs. I'm not a photorealist. I'll leave that to the photorealist, you know? So I, I want to engage in something that's just exciting, just from the point of view, that is a piece of art. How can I make it exciting for myself? And for that, it often means that, uh, that the illusionistic element, if you like, sometimes starts to fail. But in fact, for me, that is a boon. That is what is the trigger that gets things really interesting. It's, we all know what a chair on a floor and a shadow and a spatial reality is like. We understand that. As a figurative painter, I need to somehow break down those assumptions of realism, if you like. Otherwise, I'd be bored sideways and I'd, I'll just show my collages, if you like. I'll just show my source material. Somehow, I've got to make these paintings alive. And that sometimes it gets that point of just starting to fail, and that's when it gets interesting, you know? It's like, it's like a sort of a piece of music, you know, that starts to sound really, really bad, but, but that bad bit makes everything else around it sound really fantastic. Huh?